Thank you, Professor Apurvanan, and all the distinguished panelists who have spoken before me. Before I say something about the book, I would like to say a couple of things to the questions which were raised. First of all, I would like to address the question raised in the front row by Professor Asim Siddiqui of AMU. Okay, that there is a thought that considering so many, 30% of Muslims do not matter in Assam and 18% Muslims do not seem to matter in UP, so why don't they withdraw from electoral politics altogether? In other words, why don't they stop voting? That's an idea which has been voiced more than once in the past, but it's, so I to say, it's a very dangerous suggestion. Unfortunately, the powers that be are working on it at the ground level. Unknown to most of us, 25% of Indian Muslims in states like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, and even Bihar have been disenfranchised. Like all these people had their voting cards earlier, they, had, they have their Aadhaar cards, they have their passports, Russian cards, everything. But they, in the new electoral cards which have come, their names are missing. In some of the cases where they, their names are there, their age is diametrically opposite to what their actual age is. So if a 25-year-old young man or a woman wants to go and cast his or her vote, when she goes to cast the vote, she discovers that she has been called as 95 years old. So 25-year-old won't match a 95-year-old, so she won't be allowed to cast her vote. This is the reality. Silently, one-fourth of Indian Muslim population has been disenfranchised. And I guess there is a write-up about it in the new edition of Frontline. Secondly, to the question which Imtiaz raised, that in ko Aligarh mein Bihari kaha jata tha, or Bihar mein Mia, well, we are on the same page. There are so many ways of being an Indian Muslim, just as there are so many ways of being an Indian. It's like you look at a common Indian Muslim in UP or Bihar, when he goes to office, he normally gets into formal trousers and shirts, and maybe, depending on his job, he, gets, he puts on a tie and all that. But when he comes back home, he ceases to be the modern working professional and goes back to his roots. He gets into a tahmat with a banyan or maybe a kurta pajama. You go down south, people would not know about, kur about kurta pajama. They would have their own mundu. So there are different ways of being a Muslim. All that is the glue is the faith factor. And that faith is the glue. It is not an inhibiting factor. I've seen mosques in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, which have their Friday sermons in Tamil, just as you have a mosques in a place like Delhi, which have their Friday sermons in, in Urdu, which I contest. I often ask them to do it in English, because less and less youngsters understand Urdu these days, and erroneously, Urdu has been associated with our community. Now for the idea of India question which that young lady raised over there, it's something we are all seized of. So I'll give you a couple of examples from my own life. I'll, maybe I have talked about them passing in, in my book also fleetingly. One is obviously the example which one of the distinguished panelists talked of, of the Imam of Asansol. His 16-year-old <coughs> boy, his son, had been killed by people who were supposedly taking out a Ram Navmi procession and mouthing very provocative slogans. And in retaliation, the Muslim community was all, right, all set so to set a fire any house they could lay on, which belonged to the majority community. At that time, the Imam Sahib came out right in front of, just before the funeral prayer of his son, said, if anybody were to harm any Hindu today, I am going to leave this town forever. And that gentleman has been an imam of that masjid for 30 years. So it takes a lot of courage to say that you are going to leave your home and heart of 30 years. But he was ready to do so because he believed that killing and counter-killing is never going to lead to peace. So therein lies the idea of India. Two, other examples, one of which again was quoted by a distinguished panelist here about Ankit Saxena in Delhi, a Hindu boy who dared to love a Muslim girl and was allegedly killed by her family members and, and others. 
but the boy's father instead of preaching retaliation retribution vendetta or any such thing this ramzan he came forward and hosted an, an inter community iftar thinking if the girl had married into his family she would have liked to host an iftar so i would rather do that and build bridges between people rather than get into the politics of we and they i'll say one small thing from my own personal life i spent some part of my childhood not a long but some part of my childhood in delhi's lajpat nagar colony now when i was in lajpat nagar when i looked on my right when i looked on my right on left front or back there was not a single muslim family lajpat nagar is or at least at that time was a completely refugee colony where people had migrated with the setting up of pakistan from lahore rawalpindi peshawar so very often we'll find politicians of different parties and there i am with uh, shahid bhai they would come and mouth the most provocative of slogans and give very provocative speeches never would it strike to them that among the audiences there could be a muslim man they would say the ultimate things about muslims always equating them with pakistan because they thought that, that this is a colony of refugees from pakistan so they would all be hindus or sikhs but it didn't strike them that among them they could be one or two muslims who will object to that kind of portrayal in the same colony where i lived i had a very good friend and i used to play cr- cricket with him his grandparents had migrated from pakistan and i'm talking of late 70s early 80s so we used to play cricket every sunday for 3 4 hours and other days also at the end of our match we'll all gather at his home for a little nice meal which his mother used to prepare like it happens in most of the middle class colonies we would all sit on the floor cross leg his mother would start serving all the kids we'll all have a steel thali i was the privileged one as i thought at that time i never got to eat in that steel thali instead she would always serve me in a plastic floral thali once or twice out of innocence i grabbed the steel plate she would tell me in hindi o ka ke tere khane ka ye nahi hai tu to raja beta hai tujhe to main phool wali tray mein khilaungi that phool wali tray was a mark of apartheid which i didn't realize at that time yet if i had my heart saddened by such something like that at least in retrospect in the same colony in lajpat nagar in krishna market there used to be a temple and again we boys would run away every now and then to the temple obviously kids do not have anything like devotion on their mind so we would have a cricket ball and a bat in our hand and we would start playing our game of cricket in the temple compound itself the pandit ji would never object he would always say kake dhyan rakhna ball andar nahi jani chahiye so the boys made sure that the ball never entered the sanctum sanctorum but we would play cricket there and that pandit ji was aware that among the 8 9 boys playing cricket almost every other afternoon in summers was azia us salam and he never objected he loved me as much as he loved any other guy and he admonished me as much as any other guy over there so therein lies the hope of our country we have talked of the idea of india that idea of india shall survive with the imam of asansol with the pandit ji of lajpat nagar and not through golwalkar or head, or head giver thank you very much thank you all for your patience i'd like to thank uh, professor apurvanand for anchoring this panel discussion and for all the panelists and our chief guests uh, professor ansari for being here thank thank you have a great evening thank you